Saying that a car is a fast car is really a relative statement, and I would say that that's true for 95% of the time, but with certain cars, it really doesn't matter what you compare it to, it's gonna be a fast car no matter what, and the 911 Turbo is one of those cars. But a brand new 911 Turbo is quite expensive with a starting MSRP just under $200,000, and that's simply too much money for a mass majority of the population to be able to afford. But that might not be the end of the story because there might still be some hope if you want a 911 Turbo, and this is that hope. It's the 996 generation of the 911 Turbo, or in other words, the least expensive iteration of the turbo trim. Now, I did a video previously of the base model Carrera for the 996 generation, and I talked about how it was such a great bargain car for the price. Today's video is really only going to be solidifying that idea because this car is quite impressive. So I'll take you through the exterior design, interior design, we'll talk through the specs. I won't be taking this out for a drive because as you'll see later in the video, this is one of the cleanest examples of the 996 Turbo that I've ever seen and I don't wanna risk anything happening to the car, but I have driven a 996 Turbo, so I'll tell you what the car is like just from my experience, then we'll find out which of the car cave crates it fits into. Start by talking about the exterior design on this car. There are some notable differences between the Turbo and the base Carrera, even back with the 996 generation. You have a different front bumper with some large functional front vents to provide that necessary cooling. Same headlights, and actually the dimensions of this car differ from the standard car. It's 0.4 inches lower to the ground, 2.4 inches wider in its stance, and 0.2 inches longer. Onto the side profile of the turbo, and you have 18 inch wheels as standard on this car. This specific example actually has the wheels off of the GT3 from this generation, and they look great. It stands to reason that the side skirts had to be reworked for the turbo to be able to accommodate the wider rear fenders on this car, so they sort of flex outward when you look at them compared to a standard Carrera. And this is a great way to be able to tell a 911 Turbo or a Turbo S apart from any other trim because this scoop is really only for those two, the Turbo and the Turbo S. Finally, the rear section of the car, you have these little gills on the side that helps the car breathe underwater. Standard two exhaust pipes, your turbo badge and your rear wing. Now the rear wing on this car is interesting. You'll notice a little seam right here, and that's because the bottom section of this wing is fixed in place. The top section will actually raise itself when you exceed 75 miles per hour. That will give you some added downforce over the rear axle of your car, as well as make sure that all of the police know that you're currently breaking the speed limit. But don't worry about that, because if they pull you over, which they won't, because you're in a 911 Turbo and they can't catch you, there is actually a button on the dashboard of the car so that you can raise and lift the wing yourself. So if they are unusually knowledgeable about the 996 generation of the 911 Turbo, and they say, well, sir, I know you broke the speed limit because your wing was up, you can say, no, I didn't, I pushed the button inside. Back to the Turbo badge, because I also want to make the note that the Turbo badge on this car means a little bit different than what the Turbo badge will mean on a modern car. All modern 911s are turbocharged, so the turbo badge really only means that you have the highest trim of the 911. With the exception of the GT3 or the GT3 RS, every 911 has turbos. When this car came out, the turbo badge meant that your car had a turbocharger. If it didn't have a turbo badge, it was naturally aspirated. Onto the interior of this car, and it's going to be all very predictable if you've watched my last video of the base Carrera, because the interior is not really going to change between the trims unless you get certain options. But that being the case, interior on this car is immaculate. Like I said, this car is so well maintained, but even if it wasn't, I've been in many 996s and they hold up really well. You have to understand that this car is a 2004, the specific one, but the 996 Turbo came out in 2001. So today, in 2023, this is a 22-year-old design, over two decades, and you see how well it's held up. Now, seating position is great. It's a Porsche, of course. You have your very iconic large tachometer in the center with the little turbo insignia as well. I will say that I'm six foot two. I fit in the car, no problems. I've got plenty of headroom as well. Very comfortable seats are fantastic. I will say though that the adjustability for the steering wheel, it is telescopic, so it comes out and in, but it doesn't go up and down. So if you get the six speed manual like I have here, it might be a little interesting to do the clutch. You hit the bottom of the steering wheel, so you just gotta 
kind of let your leg out at an angle. The technology obviously is dated, but again, we're talking about two decades ago. But here's something that's interesting. This is my cell phone. It's a modern iPhone. And Porsche has a little shelf here, which is suspiciously the perfect size for my phone. Now, how they knew how big and what shape phones would be 20 years in the future, I don't know, but they did. It also has a light here, which is pretty cool, so you can turn off the screen if you're landing the car at night. Conventional e-brake. I miss these on cars. And I don't like the pushing the button and waiting for the sound effect so that you know that the car's e-brake has been engaged. And then there's always that little dance where you open the door and you, you kind of gingerly take your foot off of the brake because you're not quite sure if it's actually engaged. There's no questions asked. It's off, it's on. Love that, miss that, wish it would come back. I said before that I've driven this car in the past, not this specific one. And interestingly enough, the 996 Turbo was actually the first 911 that I had ever driven. And my expectations at the time were that it wasn't gonna be that fast because I was dumb and I didn't know anything about Porsches and I didn't know what a 911 Turbo was or why any of that stuff mattered. But beyond that, I knew that it was an older car when I was driving it and so my expectation was it wouldn't be that fast. This car is extremely fast and it's a very, very amazing driving experience because you get so much feedback from the car. So if you want a more mechanical sensation when you're driving, this is the car to go for and at such an attractive price point. But before I get into price, let me tell you about the specs. So specs. The engine from this car is actually a racing derived engine from a 1998 Le Mans winning Porsche 911 GT1. It's a 3.6 liter twin turbocharged flat six. It makes 420 brake horsepower, 415 pound feet of torque. Now it being a turbo drive goes to all four wheels. It's an all wheel drive platform and zero to 60 really depends on what transmission you choose of two options. We had a six-speed manual like the one that this car has here and at the time there was a five-speed Tiptronic S. The six-speed manual was the faster option and it did zero to 60 in 4.2 seconds. That is insanely fast especially when you consider that the car is over two decades old. If you wanted to get the same level of performance out of a modern Porsche you'd have to go for something like a 718 Cayman GT4. Now other cars of that era, like a 2004 Lamborghini Gallardo, had more power, was more expensive, and yet this car was still faster. All of that is very impressive, and it's made more impressive when you consider how much this car costs. The starting MSRP when it came out in 2004, this specific car, was $128,000. But fast forward to today, and pricing has changed quite a bit. Now I went onto Car Gurus and I searched every single 996 Turbo for sale in the United States. I came up with around 50 examples. I took all of their prices and averaged it out to an average listing price of $77,000. Now $77,000 is not a lot of money for a sports car of this caliber, especially from a brand like Porsche. And it's made even better when you think well, maybe I'll go for the 997, the car that replaced it. I did the same thing on Car Gurus, and that had an average listing price of $105,000. That's almost a $30,000 premium over this car. Why not go for a 993, the car that this replaced? Surely an older 911 would cost a little bit less, but you'd be wrong. I could only find two of those for sale with an average listing price of $280,000. So when you consider all of that, this car is excellent value for money. It's $30,000 cheaper than the car that replaced it and a couple hundred thousand dollars cheaper than the car that it replaced. And it was faster than a Lamborghini of its day. And if you wanna get a car from today, like the GT4 that I mentioned, even that is over $100,000. So why is it that this car is less expensive. Why don't more people find an interest in the 996? A big part of that price discrepancy between the different generations has to do with the looks of the 996. More specifically, these headlights, because they deviated from the shape that all other 911s had. 911 or Porsche files really wanted that same ovular structure that all of the other generations had and they rejected the 996 largely because it didn't have that. 
And I'm sorry, that's really ridiculous. That's like hating somebody because of the curvature of their ears. It doesn't really make any sense, but there is an added benefit for anybody looking for a 911 Turbo because it meant you can get a proper, proper 911 sports car for much cheaper if you just look past a headlight design. Now, there was another issue with the 996 generation that is a little bit more understandable, and that has to do with something called the IMS bearing. I don't want to get too much into it because everybody talks about it and it's just been blown out of proportion. So check out my video on the 996 Carrera, the base car. I talk a little bit more about it or the 986 Boxster. Go a little bit more into detail in those videos. But the bottom line is if the IMS bearing were to fail, it would take your engine and transmission with it. And that's a big issue. But with the 996 Turbo, it had a different design for the engine and transmission than any other trim of the car. So it didn't have the IMS bearing issue. So that concern about the reliability simply isn't there. So if you really can just look past these headlights, which if you really look at them, they're not that bad. And I think the older the car is, the easier it is to forgive that Porsche changed the headlights for this gen. You can really have a proper, proper sports car for much cheaper. Finally, the car cave crates. These are gonna be a couple of different categories that I either agree or disagree that the car will fit into. And that'll be things like collectability, daily drivability, trackability-ness, and whether or not the car should be avoided altogether. With the 996 Turbo, I do think it has a collectible quality for a couple of reasons. First of all, these actually used to be even cheaper. You used to be able to get a pretty decent example for $30,000, $40,000 not too long ago. That is no longer the case. They're starting to come up. And I think that's because there's a lot more appreciation for the 996. And I think that's gonna continue as time goes on. So that's number one. Number two, it comes as a manual. And with modern 911s, you cannot get a 911 turbo with a manual transmission unless you're willing to dish out the money for something like a 911 Sport Classic, which is way, way more expensive and only rear wheel drive. As far as daily drivability, I think it's as easy to drive every day as any other trim of the 911 from this generation. And that means that I think it's a great car to drive as a daily. A lot of people have commented on previous videos saying that they do daily drive their 911s. They really enjoy it. So I'm gonna go ahead and take their word for it. As far as trackability, this generation of the 911 Turbo set a very similar, actually I think almost exactly the same lap time as a Ferrari 360 Modena Challenge Stradale. So that is high praise. If anything, I think it was a seven minute, 56 second lap time, which is very impressive. So if you can track the car and you can afford to do so, highly recommend it. As far as whether or not you should avoid it, I'd say no. The only reason you should avoid a 911 996 Turbo is if either you can't afford it, which nothing wrong with that, even if it's cheaper, it's still an expensive car, or if you just can't look past those headlights. And I'm sorry, but that's just kind of a silly reason. But at the end of the day, when you buy a car, you should buy a car for yourself. So if you really just can't stand the headlights, it's the only other reason I would say not to get one. But that's all I have for this video. Thank you so much for watching. And a huge thank you to Porsche of Ontario who have loaned me this beautiful 996 Turbo to do this video. As I said, this car is for sale and it is one of the cleanest examples I've ever seen. So if you're in the market for one of these, you owe it to yourself to check out their website and check out this car. So I'll leave links to their website, their social media, as well as the posting for this car. Other than that, leave me a comment below with your thoughts on the 996 Turbo or use it as a platform to share your Turbo stories for everybody else to read. Like and subscribe to show your support for the channel and hit the bell icon so you don't miss a post. I try to post at least once a week. But until the next video, thanks for watching and take care.